Thank you very much, Harley. It's always a pleasure to speak at the uh, center here, which I think has really earned a reputation for the US for covering things in a way that really nobody else uh, does in Latin America and related issues. So uh, that's the, the title of awards, a little bit of a, of a misleading <laughs> test, because really, uh, basically, there are no national solutions to the problems of the garment industry, be it in, in Bangladesh or in any of the five countries in Central America or in the United States. In Los Angeles, for example, there's still about 40,000 garment workers in sweatshops in LA, only about half of which are registered with the state. So all the issues that are before the global garment industry are really the same in every country with a different little tweak. Of course, it all started out in a big way in terms of industrial work here in the United States. This is. 1903 in New York City, a tenement where garment production was done literally on a family basis in workers' homes. Uh, a couple of years, you know, a couple uh, up, up the chain a little bit, you got to smaller uh, sweatshops. Of course, sweatshop being uh, the term that was first used for the garment industry. The garment industry was where it first got its uh, name. These are uh, then so-called industrial size uh, garment uh, uh, shops, which ostensibly were considered to be very light and airy, as you can see here, a lot of areas where workers were at uh, sewing machines. This wasn't the triangle shirtwaist fire, but it was a very similar sort of thing, is that they had all these scraps in the triangle shirtwaist fire, which was the ninth and tenth floors, and the fire started among the scraps and then just consumed the two floors, which of course, as we learned in Bangladesh 100 years later, were locked, the doors were locked, and so as a consequence, 146 women uh, died in the Triangle Shirt Waste Fire, including many that threw themselves off the ninth floor, 10th floor, so as not to be burned alive. So really, the issues uh, that are facing Bangladesh or Central America in terms of garment workers are not new issues. They're issues that have been around for more than a century. Uh, it's also an industry that sort of uh, prided itself on, on reaching the bottom line as, as, and, and the race to the bottom more than any others. In the United States, of course, you had textile manufacturing started in, in New England uh, in, in the famous uh, strike of Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1912. Uh, and then little by little, the <coughs> manufacturing moved first to further and further south until it got to the Carolinas and Alabama and Mississippi, and then it moved offshore altogether. Apparel production in the United States was always sort of centered in New York City, where there's still something on the order of, of 50 or 60,000 garment workers in New York City, uh, also in, in sweatshops. Uh, they had a thing called the, the multi-fiber arrangement that st uh, took, started in 1974, which was an effort uh, by the United States government actually to provide employment in countries around the world and developing world. And that's where Bangladesh actually got its start in Central America, got its start in the, in the garment business. That ended in, in 2004, and a big chunk of the, of the business then moved directly to China. So that China is the number one producer of garments uh, in the world today. Bangladesh, believe it or not, is number two uh, behind China. And the number three in terms of the United States imports are, is Honduras, which has a very large uh, garment industry, which we'll talk about in a second. However, the characteristics of these and the industry are basically the same everywhere. You pick a country, you pick a garment shop, this is what you're going to find. Uh, low wages, uh, the piecework, which is where the term sweating came from, uh, as people were sweated to death in terms of they had to hit production quotas and piecework. Very long hours, forced overtime in 1911 and in 2015. Uh, child labor uh, is not so much an issue in, in many of the garment export uh, factories now because that's a high profile uh, concern of the brands, but it's still overwhelmingly a female workforce in, in Bangladesh, it's 80% uh, women, and in Central America the same story. You have a lot of problems with physical, verbal, and sexual abuse in the industry, uh, unsafe and unhealthy conditions which people are familiar with. 
There's tremendous restrictions on rights for garment workers, uh, particularly in what's known as export processing zones, EPZs, or free trade zones, where in many places, including the countries in Central America, national laws are actually suspended altogether. National laws to protect uh, uh, labor rights uh, don't, are not applicable, have no jurisdiction inside the EPZs. Uh, and then there's you know, repression of unions throughout uh, the industry. This was a uh, thing that was put together by McLean's, uh, which is kind of Canada's uh, Time magazine, uh, in, in 2011. I thought it was interesting because they figured out what it, what it cost for a $14 shirt. I assume these are Canadian dollars. But the labor portion of a $14 shirt is exactly 12 cents. Interestingly, the factory profit is only 58 cents on a $14 shirt. And so the actual total production cost is under six bucks. So that means that the brand and the retailer, or could be the brand and the retailer together, have a 60% markup on any garment. So this is an industry that makes you know, a shitload of money, and they do it off of both exploitation of labor and also of the factory owners. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the health and safety uh, problems in the garment industry, which are, again, true in any country that you're in. Uh, it's not a very uh, elaborate uh, or sophisticated process to cut and sew uh, garments, but there are uh, hazards related to chemicals, particularly the spot removing chemicals, which tend to be tr strong solvents. Noise is a problem. Repetitive motions and production stress, mostly from the quotas. Most of the garment factories in the world are in, in tropical climates, so you have extreme heat in many of these factories. The, the bathrooms, living quarters, and the cafeteria food, especially in China where you have big cities where people live in dormitories, they work in the plant, they eat at the plant cafeterias, these are a, a big problem. Uh, problems with handling and storage of hazardous waste. And then it becomes an environmental as well as an occupational health issue in that many of the communities surrounding garment factories are badly contaminated uh, land, water, and air. In Central America, to look at the, the five countries together and try and keep some of these statistics in mind when we talk about uh, Bangladesh, the exports in 2012 were 7.8 billion, uh, and about 40% of those came from the EPZs, which, as I mentioned, were areas where there are no labor laws uh, to speak of. It's a, a major national export product uh, in some of the five countries, up to uh, 80% uh, in the case of Honduras. And most of the, the, is, the product is exported to the United States. The, the employment of the industry has been up and down. Uh, reportedly, CAFTA, the Central America Free Trade Agreement, was supposed to result in greater employment. Uh, actually, the opposite has had the effect. You have less uh, garment employment, primarily because China is eating everybody's lunch, than you did as promised by CAFTA. But at the high point, uh, a couple of years ago, there were about 500,000 workers, garment workers in, in Central America. Like other garment workers in the world, they're mostly women. They mostly come from rural areas. Uh, and there were about 600 garment factories in Central America. Monthly wages ranged uh, from 375 to 115, depending on what country you were talking about or what city. But the living wage uh, portion of that, the, the wages only made up less than a third of what people actually needed to, to live on. Uh, unionization rates in Central America, as most everybody is familiar with, are very low and very severe repression. So this is a garment uh, factory uh, in Honduras, a very similar, very, actually it's in Mexico, there's a Mexican flag in the back. It's a uh, it's very common uh, format uh, for garment factories everywhere uh, around the world. One thing that's important to notice in Central America and other parts outside of Bangladesh is that because population density is not as high in Central America, believe it or not, as it is in Bangladesh, most of the uh, garment maquiladoras, this is outside of San Pedro Sula in Honduras, uh, are low you know, one-story buildings. And this is important to keep in mind when we talk about building collapses and fires in Bangladesh in a little while. So most of the industrial production there is you know, ground level. Um, Bangladesh. Uh, by way of contrast, you had 7.8 billion in, in exports from Central America, 24 billion in exports in, in 2014, 60 percent of it which went to the European Union, 30 percent to the U.S. And this represents 80 percent of the total national exports in Bangladesh. So this is it. Uh, this is the most important 
industry they have there. Even though they have a workforce of 78 million uh, workers, 4 million workers of those are in the cut and sew industry. 80% are women and rural. And there are about 3,500 factories and about 500 in the EPZs, um, which are uh, focused mostly in this port city of Chittagong, which we'll see in a minute. The minimum wage here was $37 a month at the time of the Rana Plaza. And as a result of massive worker protests in 2014, they raised it to a whopping $68 a month. These are for four 60-hour work weeks, just like Central America. Uh, but actually, the, the Garment Manufacturers Association themselves report that 40% of their members are not paying the new minimum wage because they consider it to be too high. So there are a lot of uh, garment workers that are still on $37 a month. This is a problem because the landlords from whom they rent their houses heard about the raise in the minimum wage and raised everybody's rents. So in a certain sense, and some of the workers are still at the old minimum wage, their, 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 way, their rent for the house they live in went up 50 to 60 percent, and they're not making the money. The unionization rate, of course, is under 2 percent in, in Bangladesh. So this is, uh, as you may remember, Bangladesh, India is over here, Southeast Asia is there. Chittagong is the main port uh, where most of the EPCs are. Most of the production is done in industrial suburbs outside of Dhaka. So there's this tremendous, uh, <clears throat> uh, there's a very dangerous road that goes from Dhaka to here where you have uh, uh, trucks with containers on them going as fast as they possibly can in order to get to the product uh, to Chittagong as soon as possible. So this is uh, a, a, a garment shop I was in last October. So if you look back uh, to the, to the uh, slide from Central America, it's basically except for the, uh, you know, the, the people, it's the same process. You know, the same uh, uh, machines, the same clothing uh, and cloth and the like. And it looks very much the same. Some of the shops are quite big. Uh, the, the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Export Association actually has about 5,000 members. And of them, about 200 are multimillionaires. These are people that have huge uh, uh, chains of garment factories. They have factory, 30 factories in a couple of the big companies. So these are people with tremendous resources if they were interested and willing uh, to put them into good things. So the other thing that, unfortunately, Bangladesh makes it unique is that they've had these series of industrial disasters starting uh, 10 years ago with the Spectrum sweater collapse, which we'll see in a second, and these others which are probably familiar with the terrible fire and the Hameen group also on the ninth and 10th floors, I mean, an exact duplicate of what happened with the Triangle Shirtwaist fire, the Tazreen fire uh, where there were 112 dead, 58 were burned beyond recognition, so they were buried in a mass grave, and then Rana Plaza, of course, where you had 1,100 people killed in one fell swoop. Now, the common elements for these industrial uh, uh, disasters are really known to everybody, including the brands, including the middlemen, including the factory owners. And that is because they have these high-rise uh, factory buildings, uh, which are eight, nine, ten stories high, is due to the population density of Bangladesh. But there are no, uh, as, as we can talk about later, there are actually no structural steel in any of these buildings. So you're talking about a nine-story building that has no structural steel in it. And then if you put heavy, vibrating electrical generators up on the seventh floor, uh, because the electrical system is not reliable in Bangladesh, then the whole thing comes down, as it did in the case of the Spectrum sweater. Uh, they had no building codes at all until the Spectrum sweater uh, collapsed in 2005. And the other aspect that's interesting, which is worthy of a whole other discussion, is the whole is the complete failure in Bangladesh, which is really the complete failure throughout global supply chains of so-called corporate social responsibility. It's a whole cottage industry, which is now $10 billion globally on uh, allegedly certifying good conditions in these factories. So this was the Spectrum sweater uh, collapse, 2005. This was, as, as, as occurred on a couple occasions, initially it was a five-story building, no structural steel, as I mentioned. Then they put four more stories on top of it, no structural plans, no engineering plans, no permits. And lo and behold, the whole thing came down, uh, killed uh, several hundred people, and, and uh, building collapses are bad because you have a lot of amputations and spinal injuries. So you have a situation where the, the, the living end up uh, envying the dead if they spend the rest of their lives uh, unable to work or in wheelchairs or the equivalent. 
This is the Hameen uh, fire in 2010. Again, sort of a replay of the uh, Triangle Shirtwaist fire. A fire broke out on the ninth and 10th stories. People threw themselves off of the, of the building as well as burned to death. This was uh, the Tazreen fire, which began on the, on the bottom of another building that had been six stories. They added three more. On the ground floor, they had stored all the flammable materials immediately adjacent to the electrical generators, which started sparking and then started a fire. So that's what it looked like, and this is what it looked like the next day. So there's 112 people died in that, 58 burned. Beyond recognition, you can understand why. The fire started here, and the entire thing uh, was, a, was a chimney, basically. Then, of course, uh, Rana Plaza, which people are familiar with. This was, again, a, a five-story building. They were adding three more on top of it, the whole thing. It was built, actually, on a swamp. Uh, so it had no business building the, the building there at all. It was it's soft ground, a swamp. And lo and behold, it came down. 1,138 people uh, dead, 2,500 injured. Uh, this is a famous photograph. Nobody knows the story here, whether these people actually knew one another or in the, in the last milliseconds of their lives, they, they reached out to one another. <clears throat> so this is a big problem for the garment industry, as you can see, 20% sweat, 20% blood made in Bangladesh. So it meant that, you know, as of Rana Plaza, the, the industry was never going to be able to ship more document, garments from Bangladesh which it wanted to because it's so cheap, as you can see, even much cheaper than Central America, unless they did something about it. So the something about it uh, were two competing programs, really. Uh, the first is what's called the Accord, and the second is what's called the Alliance, and I'll talk about them uh, in turn. In my view, the, the, the Accord is the real, is the real deal, is, is a game changer. Uh, it was a, an agreement that was signed in May of 2013 between two international unions and their local uh, affiliates, and now 150, 190 brands, uh, mostly in Europe, but there's about a dozen uh, U.S. brands that have signed on uh, as well. So there are about 1,500 factories with about 2 million workers, or about half the industry. It's a five-year program, and the brands themselves have to actually pay the money in an annual fee to the Accord so that it can function. They have genuinely independent inspections. These are inspections were done only in three areas, but nonetheless, these are important. That's fire, electrical, and building safety. Uh, and in those three areas, uh, the Accord hired international uh, consulting companies of engineers to do the inspections. The fire engineers came from the United States. The uh, electrical engineers came from Korea and three building engineers, one from Korea, one from Taiwan, and I forget where the other one was. But these were the first genuinely independent, accurate inspections ever done in Bangladesh or in any part of the garment uh, supply chain, which makes it, uh, I think, an important advance. All of the reports from these uh, inspections are up on the website. If you go to the Bangladesh Accord website, you can see them, and they have a lot of scary photographs up there in terms of electrical uh, you know, uh, configurations, which are just going to be a, a fire tomorrow, no question about it. They've had some pictures where the, the floors were bowed with the weight of materials that were put on it. And of course, if they actually came down, you would have a pancake effect. The, uh, the Accord has mandatory repairs. That means once a report has been issued, uh, they ha the, the brands are responsible for working with their factories, suppliers, to actually correct these hazards. And if the brands, if the factories claim poverty, then the brands under the Accord have to put up the money. So the bottom line is these things have to be fixed, paid either by the factories or by the brands. And then there's also a two-year requirement that once a, a factory has been inspected, the brands can't leave that factory. What happens in the past is that you know brands would, would uh, have uh, sourcing from a terrible factory, which they knew to be terrible, and then somebody would tell it was terrible, and then they'd leave right then and there. Well, not under the accord. They have to stay once these factories are and fix the problems within a two-year period. There's also under the accord a significant amount of uh, worker participation, which is up and down given the political situation and really the industrial relations of any given factory. But under the accord, uh, the workers uh, have a right to uh, participate in inspection walkarounds. There's a requirement now for health and safety committees, which is both Bangladesh law and uh, part of the accord, which are now slowly coming into being into formation. 
There's requirements for training so that the workforce actually knows uh, the chemicals that they're working with, the fire hazards associated with them, what the emergency action plan is and the like. And workers under the court actually have the right to refuse unsafe work, which is not an insignificant matter. If the workers at, at uh, Rana Plaza, who knew full well that they were going into a building that was about to collapse, had a right to refuse to go into that building and not lose their job, there would have been 1,100 less dead people. It's also a legally binding agreement between the brands and the international unions, and there's uh, arbitration courts in Europe which are, are may well hear uh, about this because uh, the progress to date uh, is about 1,100 of the 1,500 factories were inspected in 2014, and about 25 factories were closed, which is a good thing. Even though it meant that people lost their jobs, it means maybe 25 Rana Plazas didn't happen either. Uh, there's been 490 follow-up inspections to date with a focus on the highest hazard. 250 new initial inspections in 2015 with another set of three international uh, firms uh, doing the inspections. And then all the reports are posted on, on the website if you want to see them. During uh, the first 1,100 inspections, they identified 80,000 safety violations in these plants. Uh, and as a result of the inspection, every uh, plan has to have a corrective action plan that has to be approved by the Accord and there has to be funding for that corrective action plan by the brands or by the factories. So of the 1,100 factories, uh, 500 already have approved plans, another 400 have been submitted for review. Uh, as of January, a couple months ago, 11,000 hazards have been corrected and these are being verified by the Accord's own Bangladeshi engineers, they have about a dozen on staff and field resource people that are union people that are working uh, with the Accord. Uh, there have been, uh, in terms of worker participation, some advances or one step forward, two steps back. There are three cases of workers that filed uh, health and safety complaints and were retaliated against. These were Accord factories. And uh, the Accord was not able to get the uh, brands to, or the su supplier factories to rehire them. So they're going through the escalation process that's part of the uh, of the Accord where it goes up to the brands uh, to order their suppliers to actually reinstate people. Interestingly, one factory of these three has dropped out of the Accord altogether saying they're now going to source only to Korean factories because Koreans don't ask for all these ridiculous things. So who cares about the Accord? We're just going to produce for Korea. There are also 14 companies that have been put on notice last month uh, for termination uh, on, of uh, under the Accord because they're failing to actually implement the corrective action plans. They were identified hazards and they simply failed to correct them. So these may go to the European uh, binding arbitration if any of the companies decide to contest that. Uh, also the Accord has developed over the last you know, year, uh, year really, uh, or two years, uh, a fire safety manual and a lot of online remediation guides, some videos a pocket guide on wor worker rights which have been sent around. They're about uh, to open up field offices in Chittagong and Ghazipur is a big industrial suburb just north of Dhaka. They have a training department with five members which uh, some people from here including myself and two members of the Labor Occupational Health Program here at the Public Health School. We did a, a series of trainings in October with a training department and they're uh, now in the process as I mentioned of forming these factory uh, committees. Now, you know, the Accord is not without some controversies. Uh, this is a private initiative and there are uh, left-wing uh, people in the United States and in Asia that think these are bad ideas to have private initiatives because it constitutes really corporate funded uh, privatization of what should be government functions. Governments should be inspecting these things. Governments should be requiring uh, the plans to do so. And, and frankly, that's absolutely correct. The problem is is that in Bangladesh and, and in Central America, we could think about this as well, the government really has no interest in protecting garment workers. And if there was no initiative like the Accord, then literally people would die in Bangladesh from fires or building collapses, which are 100% preventable. So it's a big dilemma, I think, for people that are in favor of the state, the role of the state, the role of public sector, uh, how are we going to make this work in a situation where the, guard, the public sector is either captured by the employers or simply doesn't function at all? Uh, a second issue, of course, is it's not only fire, electrical, and building, which are hazards of garbage workers, but those are the only three things that are covered by the Accord. 
Also, the accord doesn't really address any of the underlying causes why we have uh, bad working conditions in government uh, in Central America, Los Angeles, or, or Bangladesh, the whole sweatshop business model, the race to the bottom, uh, you know, the iron triangle, the lowest possible price, the best, the highest possible quality, and the fastest possible delivery. That's not touched uh, by the accord. And it was born as a top-down initiative. It was an agreement between two unions in Switzerland and, and a bunch of brands in Europe and the United States. And it's just now really uh, beginning to have root among uh, organizations in Bangladesh. Uh, but in my opinion, I think this is really the best chance we've ever had to deal with uh, garment supply chain issues or supply chain issues of any products, be it electronics, toys, garments, sports equipment, etc. They have an excellent program and procedures on the inspections. There are real financial resources available because the brands have to pay into the accord. This is the first time ever that uh, you know, the anti-sweatshop side of the equation actually has some resources. The brands are at least temporarily motivated to fix uh, some of these problems. There is an opportunity for workers to organize. There's an opportunity for health and safety professionals to build the capacity there. And there's the opportunity to set a positive example. Now, the competitor to this, uh, now remember the Accord is two international unions and 190 brands. Well, the Alliance, uh, which has offices here in San Francisco, actually, is led by Walmart, no surprise, and The Gap, uh, which has found itself being in the uncomfortable position of being in bed. Uh, with Walmart, and there are only 27 brands, almost all U.S. and Canadian, that are part of the alliance. It's all voluntary. There's no requirements. Anybody has to do anything apart from what they want to. No union participation. They're using the same inspection procedures that preceded all of these disasters and which failed to prevent those uh, disasters, including using some of the very same consulting companies that didn't prevent or uh, didn't identify death traps the first time around. Um, there are very limited reports of finance of the uh, of the findings, so we weren't going to publicize any of them. And then, when the Accord uh, posted everything on the, its website, then the Alliance says it will now do the same. The repairs, however, are not mandatory; they're the sole responsibility of the factory, and the brand will loan uh, the the factory owners money if they need it. But there's no guarantee that they're going to keep the the business there. So if you're a factory owner. Why are you going to take on half a million dollar debt with a company who may not, two months from now, have anything in your factory? They're not going to keep sourcing there. There's no requirement. Uh, and also, what the main thing about the alliance is a very sophisticated and high-powered uh, public relations uh, effort. They have uh, in Washington, D.C., their representative of the alliance is, uh, the, Mar is the former Secretary of State, uh, Madeleine Albright's lobbying firm. Uh, who I don't think knows very much about health and safety, but certainly knows a lot about PR. Uh, the president of the alliance is Ellen Tauscher, former congresswoman from uh, California. Uh, they got uh, two senators, uh, Olymp Olympia Snow and, and George Mitchell, uh, to do an independent evaluation of the alliance's work last year. Very high-powered, sophisticated PR operation in the alliance. Now, in addition to these two initiatives, there's also sort of a Rana, Rana Plaza moment in that there are a lot of other wheels in motion there, all of which we could think about how these would apply to Central America uh, if there were similar set of circumstances. The International Labor Organization, which of course is a UN agency, has got a huge uh, array of activities in Bangladesh right at the moment. Uh, the, there are of the uh, 3,500 factories, um, about a third of those belong to the ILO and the Bangladesh government to do the inspection because they're not producing either for Accord brands or for Alliance brands. So in the latest newsletter out of the ILO, they claim that all three of these initiatives have actually inspected 2,700 factories, which would be 77% of the 3,500, which if that's true would be an amazing accomplishment that there would be garment factories. Uh, 32 plants have been closed. The labor inspectors in June of 2013, which was um, uh, right after the Rana Plaza disaster, there were only 92 inspectors on all of Bangladesh. There's a country of 160 million people, a workforce of 78 million people, 92 inspectors. Only 20 of those were health and safety inspectors. So now they have 270, according to, to the ILO, including 44 women, women which is quite a, 
a break from tradition from the Bangladesh government. So the ILO is involved in a lot of training programs, as you might imagine. There, uh, when Todd uh, and I were there in uh, September of last year talking to people, some people told us they had been to the ILO trainings and found them a little theoretical, which means that they weren't really very useful. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, almost any training would be better than none. There's also another program that's a, a joint program between the ILO and the World Bank called uh, Better Work. It started Better Work Cambodia about a decade ago, and they're now, it's basically how to improve management and administration of the factories, including health and safety. So again, somebody should do that. It's a good thing. It's not going to solve any of their problems with the, the business model that produces uh, sweatshops, but nonetheless, there's 30 factories, 13 brands, and about uh, 50,000 workers that are involved in that. Uh, the other big initiative is there is that they're trying to get for the first time ever compensation for the people that died, for the families of the people that died at Rana Plaza, and for all those that were injured, 2,500 injured. So the ILO is administering a fund that's supposed to be 30 million. They've only raised uh, 21 and a half million as of, of uh, March 14. And there are a number of companies, including U.S. companies, that have not given a dime two years later after, uh, <clears throat> after Rana Plaza. Bennington is the big uh, focus of that activity now. It's an Italian company, obviously, but they have a lot of sales. Uh, Walmart, Children's Place, J.C. Penney, and some of these others gave totally nominal uh, contributions, which is why they're so far behind the curve on, the, on getting this, uh, the, the money they need. If they can get the uh, trust fund up and running, then it would be a good thing not only for the Rana Plaza victims, but also Tazreen Fashion and the others. And could theoretically set the a precedent throughout global supply chains that when you have terrible disasters that people get chewed up and spat out, it's the brands that are responsible for fixing it. Um, there are some other global initiatives that affect the, the, the garments in Bangladesh and Central America that are worth thinking about. In Indonesia, they have this uh, Freedom of Association Protocol, which was signed a couple of years ago after 18 months of uh, negotiation. It was six brands, including Adidas and Nike and six Indonesian unions. And it's supposed to give guidelines and rules on how the brands are going to respect uh, the rights of workers to select their own uh, unions and the freedom of association. Unfortunately, it's been a, sort of a mixed record because uh, six brands is not all the brands there are that are producing in Indonesia. And that the brands, for good reasons or bad, have been unable to convince their suppliers to respect this protocol. So it doesn't mean a whole lot if the brand signs on to something and the supplier who's the actual employer of the workers is not on board. Um, there are other uh, initiatives in the Dominican Republic, probably the world's only non-sweatshop uh, garment factory. It's called Alta Gracia uh, in a small town called Alta Gracia in the Dominican Republic, at Knights Apparel, which is based in South Carolina and does a lot of college logo, was uh, founded in 2010. And the three elements that are really key to it is they have a member-controlled union, which is very unusual in any uh, garment plant around the world. Their wages in the Alta Gracia plant are actually three times the average of DR garment pay, which is a, a huge increase, obviously, for the families. And they have a joint health and safety committee, which our little network uh, helped uh, with training on in 2010. We've been back a couple times to assist them on that. Uh, there are also initiatives on fair trade certified uh, clothing. There's a PACT is one of these. It's a factory in India uh, that's had no orders since 2011. They, they have a union or sort of a union there, but the most important thing is they have a fair trade premium which is paid to the workers. And they have a worker committee that decides what's done with this fair trade premium. That is, should they build schools? Should they give everybody you know, uh, money, uh, a slice of the money, should they have uh, a development of their kids and the like. So, and Fair Trade USA, which is based here in Oakland, actually uh, on its website says there are eight other apparel brands which have a Fair Trade certification. Again, uh, this is kind of a niche within a niche, not uh, going to have much of an impact on places like Central America or Bangladesh. Um, then uh, finally, there are sort of worker owned uh, cooperatives in uh, a city called uh, Piedras Negras on the U.S. Uh, Texas border. There's a maquila called Dignidad y Justicia, which was set up by a maquilador workers who all get fired from their plant and set up a, a shop uh, in uh, 2004. And it's got uh, the workers own about 30% of it, the, their organization, 
the CFO, the Comité Fronterizo de Obreras, owns 30%, then the people that actually uh, market the clothing in the U.S. own 40%. And they were at least successful enough to open up a, se a second facility in 2007. And then, of course, there are other worker-owned factories. Uh, in Central America, for example, there are a lot of uh, worker-owned co-ops in Guatemala. But again, these are kind of niches of, uh, of a niche. So in my view, you know, what are we going to do about bad conditions in, in the garment industry anywhere? Really, it's only going to come, I think, if there's member-controlled unions like you have in uh, Alta Gracia, if the collective bargaining agreements that at least meet or exceed the law in the countries where they function, and that there's meaningful access to effective regulatory enforcement when, when it's required, which is something which didn't exist in Bangladesh, which is why the Accord came into the existence and which clearly doesn't exist in most countries in Central America. So, uh, so then the question is, you know, what do we do in the meantime? You know, if, if uh, the gold standard is member-controlled unions that have wonderful bargaining agreements and, and cooperative governments, we're still faced at this moment with bad working conditions, uh, very exploitative employers, and, and really ineffective governments. So I, I think that really the approach uh, to take is to obviously support the workers' efforts because amazingly in almost all of these factories there are grassroots organizations that are trying to organize, workers organizing themselves to defend their rights and, and, their, and their futures. Uh, they're under a lot of attack usually, so in addition to supporting the efforts, we have to figure out how to protest the attacks on them. Uh, there's a demand that the governments do their job, <coughs> demand that the companies actually implement their corporate codes of conduct, almost all of which these big multinational brands have. And then I think the thing to, the takeaway lesson from the Accord for Central America or any other part of garment supply chains is that some of these elements I think are very important. Accurate inspections that are done by qualified people, public reporting of what those inspections uh, results are, mandatory corrections once you find a hazard, and genuine worker participation. So whatever form uh, you know, the, the advance of worker rights have to take, those elements need to be part of it. Um, so that's my two cents on the matter, and I'd be happy. I know there are a lot of people here in the room that know at least as much as I do about all this. So. <laughs> right. Uh, are there any ties uh, between people in Central America and Vienna? Any ties between? Or among the Oh, uh, yeah, actually, the Clean Clothes campaign, which is sort of, it's based in Amsterdam, and it's mostly European. There are 17 different countries in, in Europe that have clean clothes. They have, every five years, a, a, a big uh, global strategic meeting, and there was one held in November that I was able to go to in Hong Kong, and that was, um, uh, I think, the first time that they had a significant uh, delegation from Central America. It was about 15 people from uh, Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala in Honduras. Um, and so I think there were some very you know, interesting discussions uh, between garment workers. And then the Bangladeshis were there in force as well. So. May I ask you something? Sure. Um, the uh, revolving door between hot upper echelon people who work for corporations, work for the regulators, from back and forth, does that happen in Bangladesh or? or are there measures for uh, <coughs> corruption of this? Uh, yeah, the corruption is not, I mean, that's more refined level of corruption we have in the United States, which, you know, I mean, some people think that we're not very corrupt in the United States, but I, I think it just takes a different form, and, that, and the revolving door is strictly that. In Bangladesh, it's much more crude than that, which is that the, the government is very, well, you have an industry that's 80% of your national exports, uh, which is totally critical to the government's tax revenue and for development, et cetera. So the people that run that industry basically get anything they want. So the organization of the garment manufacturers called the M is the uh, BGMEA, and there's the BGK, which is knitwear instead of garments, um, BKMEA, sorry. And those two organizations basically run the government, uh, and they are about a dozen uh, factory owners which are part of the National Assembly. National Parliament, there's 300 members, so actually if you look at the U.S. Senate, I think that's what, 60% millionaires in the U.S. Senate, so only 12 and 
out of 300 in Bangladesh, that's not so bad, maybe. But in any case, so what you have are government agencies which basically have no political will um, to enforce anything. And then, uh, you know, at the time I showed you, they only had 20 inspectors uh, at the time of Rana Plaza uh, for 78 million uh, workforce. So, so it, the lack of resources, the lack of political will, rather than the revolving door, is really the problem in, in Bangladesh. I had some questions. Uh -huh. um, you, when you're talking about the garment factories that are in Bangladesh, um, what, I mean, who owns the factories? Right. So generally speaking, like in most global supply chains, you have international brands, which are the customers, right? right? And then you have local people that are the, the owners, right? right. Uh, in some cases, not the case in Bangladesh, but in other places, you'll have Taiwanese or Koreans that have factories in China or Indonesia, for example. Right. In Bangladesh, there's not much of that. There's a few Korean-owned uh, garment factories, but most of the Bangladesh factories are owned by Bangladeshis, and they're members of these management organizations, which I said, about 5,000 members nominally, but many of them, a couple hundred of them, are, are multimillionaires because they have you know, they own 30 garment factories. Right, yeah. right, and they have the connections with the brands right. to supply. Um, um, yeah, so you're saying the solutions for this issue is just having more workers, um, so they understand like what's going on by uh, being a part of unions and getting more organizations involved, I mean, that what you're saying? Well, I, I mean, I, I think uh, I, there are a lot, of, a lot of proposals out there on how to, uh, how to change global supply chains. Um, some people think that the corporate social responsibility programs of international brands are a positive thing and res resulted in positive change. I'm, I'm kind of dubious about that, but there are people, there are uh, groups of religious investors that uh, go to stockholder meetings and demand that you know that the companies actually do what they say they're going to do. Uh, there are campaign organizations which basically run scandals. They collect information and they do as much publicity as possible. Uh, NBC is that with PR? Well, no. These are these are organizations on our side, sort of, oh, okay. sort of like the United Students Against Sweatshops or the Workers' Rights Consortium or the International Labor Rights Fund and all those in DC, which find terrible working conditions and they publicize them. So there's a certain amount of pressure on that. There's you know pressure on the part of legislators, you know, like the Berkeley City Council, for example, has a no sweat ordinance. So all the clothing worn by city employees are supposed to come from non sweat shop garment factories. So all of these different things, I think, are all things that we should fire on all cylinders. I think people should do everything. In terms of having a lasting change, in my view, of how the factories actually run, the only way the factories will actually run better is if the workers who work there have the ability to actually have a voice and have some action. Now, they're not going to be able to do that individually. They're going to have to do that collectively, and collectively usually in the form of a union. Though there are you know, women's organizations, community-based organizations like that outside the factory have played that role. Because the only people that are there in the factory all day long that have an undisputed uh, concern about health, safety, you know, decent wages, decent hours, are the workforce. Right. And they're the ones who know actually how to do the production. So they're the ones, until we get a situation, which is, I grant you, is not tomorrow, yeah. it, it get to a situation where workers, and not only in garment factories, but you know, electronics factories, toy factories, any global supply chain, mm -hmm. or factories anywhere for that matter, until the workforce has some meaningful participation in it, it won't change. All this other stuff is good. You can put pressure in from the outside, but if you want to change the conditions and keep them changed, the workers have to be involved in a way that they aren't now. Right. With respect to that, how, what, what international labor efforts exist? Uh, that is, relationships between government workers in the U.S. Uh, unions and government worker unions in Bangladesh or Central America. Right. What's the state of that kind of relationship? Well, there are a number of so-called global unions, uh, mostly headquartered in, in Europe. And the, the two global unions that signed the Bangladesh Accord, one's called Industrial, Industrial, which is uh, sort of the manufacturer, mining, uh, you know, heavy industry collection. I think they 
had 150 million uh, members in, in 75 different countries and the like. So in Bangladesh, there are 14 unions uh, that are members of the Industrial Bangladesh Council or the IBC unions that you know, work directly with the, uh, the industrial union headquarters. Now, in the United States, for example, the, the, I, the industrial members are like the United Steelworkers Union, <coughs> United Auto Workers Union. So there are links that exist as to whether they've been fully operationalized in terms of solidarity and support, uh, not so clear. Well, you know, ILGW used to be one of the great unions. So right. What, where do they fit in this? Well, they're now part of Unite. Uh, part of well, part of it's in Unite, part of it's in SEIU, both of which are part of Industrial, uh, and through Industrial Switzerland have relations with the IBC um, unions in, in Bangladesh. So are they through that organization? Is there really meaningful support for the organization in Bangladesh, or is it partially kind of uh, window dressing? No, uh, I mean, I think the, the, the support that exists for that kind of union organizing is, is a direct result of the international support, wouldn't exist otherwise. The thing is that labor, labor industri uh, you know, industrial relations in Bangladesh are a very crude level. They're, they're like you know, the 19th, 19th century in the United States. I mean, these are very exploitative, very brutal factory owners. And I, I just tell you really briefly, it's a story, as I was in Chittagong in the port town, back in, in, in February of last year, so it's a year ago. And there were two uh, um, uh, young men, about 25 years old, that were leading unionizing efforts all by themselves in their factories. So one factory had about 8,000 workers, and it was this fellow and, f and four others with the leadership of the committee, all totally you know, from Bangladesh. This was their idea and stuff. So this young guy got, got called into the general manager's office, which was up on the sixth floor of this building, sat in a chair in front of the general manager, who wanted to know who the other four members of the committee was, because they figured out who he was. And he declined to tell them. And so <clears throat> the general manager got so wound up about this that he went around the, the table and slapped this guy so hard he knocked him off of the chair. And then two supervisors came in and they took him into the administrative area and beat the living daylights out of him and then threw him down the stairs. Uh, and he was fired. He was still fired by when I met with him in February. And so they were filing. So what they had to do was they had to file a, you know, a big case study that went to the Workers' Rights Consortium in, in Washington, D.C., who publicized it with the United Students for Sweatshop against sweatshops. And the information went to the industrial and went to the affiliate unions in Europe. And so a big brouhaha was made. And three months later, the guy was back on the job. But you can only imagine what the impact was of that in, you know, for the unionizing effort uh, at that plant. And that was you know, not an uncommon. Nobody thought that was. Nobody in the room who was getting this information thought that was unusual. That was kind of the way it works. So I think the biggest impediments actually for organizing in Bangladesh are not really lack of international support. It's the very brutal nature of industrial relations in, in Bangladesh, which they're going to have to sort out themselves. But there have been, since Rana Plaza, allegedly 200 unions, 200 plants now have unions that didn't have them in the two years, in this period of two years. But it's also, I mean, it's unions, it's different because they don't have collective bargaining agreements. In Bangladesh, you have a union to protect you, represent you, but you don't have a collective bargaining agreement. Uh -huh. um, I have a couple of questions. Why do you think it is that mostly European companies and not North American companies, from what I understood, um, committed to the accord? Well, I, I think there's a sort of a cultural difference among capitalists between the United States and Europe. And, which actually, for the unions, I think is kind of a disadvantage because, uh, which I'll say in a minute, but in Europe, it's, it's not unusual to have social dialogue, social partners with unions. Unions are represented on board of directors in Germany and other places. So to have an agreement with a union is not that big a deal in Europe. Uh, whereas in the United States, as we're all familiar, there are very few companies that want to have anything to do with unions and spend a lot of time preventing unions. Uh, I, the disadvantage this place, the Industrial, for example, is that I think Industrial and the other union is called Uni, which is actually uh, service sector unions. They had this idea that you know that employers in Bangladesh are like employers in Europe. You can 
have a nice social dialogue and talk about it and stuff, whereas I think labor relations in Bangladesh are much more similar to the United States than they are to Europe. Um, and then it, it seems like the, um, the success of the alliance is largely due to, I mean, or partly due to these disasters, right, in which many people died that were widely publicized. Um, and that, this, from what you said, sort of the, um, the extent of the accord is limited to the things that happened in those disasters, right? Fires and building safety and right. not all the other hazards that workers endure every day. So I guess I'm wondering, in terms of bringing those principles to Central America or elsewhere, where, as you said, the factories are constructed differently and so on, Right. Well, I mean, that's, that's the question, but I think, I think it could be done. I mean, for example, you're not going to get, I mean, it shouldn't take a, you know, a horrific disaster on the level of Rana Plaza, for example, to make a few changes. One of these changes would be, for example, almost all the plants in Central America are producing for brands. Brands claim to have third-party CSR monitors going into those factories. Well, let's see the reports. Why couldn't, as in the case of the Accord, all the reports from the Central America CSR monitors be publicized or be medically available? And then flowing from that, obviously, they're going to find a lot of problems. Well, are those problems getting fixed? Why aren't they getting fixed? Who's going to pay to get those problems fixed? Or the question on, 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 on health and safety committees. Now, in the Dominican Republic, for example, like many countries, it is required to have a health and safety committee. Uh, one of the few in the country that actually functions is the one in Alta Gracia. But nonetheless, there's no reason why uh, those uh, health and safety committees couldn't be part of all the factories that are in, in uh, Central America. Uh, the question about whether it's right to have suspension of national laws and into EPCs and free trade zones, I think that's open for discussion. Clearly, that's not uh, you know help uh, Bangladesh. It's not going to help other countries as well. So I mean, clearly. You know, the, you're absolutely right. The only way that, that the reason why Bangladesh is leading the charge on this is because 1,100 people killed, you know, got killed one morning, on the, uh, you know, following so many other tragedies. But I think that the example uh, that's been set by the Accord and its elements could be applied elsewhere, but it won't be, and of course, unless there's some political campaign or pressure. I mean, you know, the religious stakeholders, the legislators, everybody else should be coming in to say, OK, we want accord-like provisions for these other uh, countries where our products are being produced. But there aren't any guarantees on any of this stuff. And, you know, garment's been a bad place to work for 100 years. Well, I, you know, I understand that this isn't at the core of your argument about the way to go, but uh, are there particular firms in the US that, that we should look at as progressive on this and favor with our consumer choices? You know, I, I, my, people ask that all the time, especially around sportswear, you know, about whether, you know, because Nike spent a lot of money and Adidas is German and, you know, I, I think uh, the short answer is no. I think they're all sweatshops. Yeah. Uh, you know, Patagonia and a couple of the other small sort of niche people that don't have huge production, that have big CSR staffs, uh, I mean, if, if that's really you know, important for you or for a consumer to feel good about, you could, you could research those. <coughs> what, what I tell people, frankly, is that if you really, I mean, my, my view is they're all sweatshops. Um, and, and part of sweatshops is we get stuff cheaper than it would be otherwise. So if you figure that you made during the course of a year $50, you didn't pay $50 for clothing that you should have made, paid had it been made in non-sweatshop conditions, why don't you take that $50 and send it to an organization in one of the producing countries, of which there are many very good unions, women's organizations, faith-based organizations. So you know, if you, if all the consumers in the United States decided, okay, I made, you know, I made seventy-five dollars in cheap clothing this year, I'm going to send that seventy-five dollars uh, to the unions in Bangladesh, or I'm going to send it to the women's organizations in Central America. That would have a much bigger impact so than by the list of those organizations. <laughs> well, actually, you can Google them. That's not, that's not hard. Well, but you have to have a beginning point. You know, where do you? Actually, and on the Mekilador Health and Safety Support Network, there is a resource list of organizations, okay. Good. Right. which people could actually look at. What is it called? That's my, my little, if, your, your yeah, the Mekilador. Oh, that's, okay. right. that's what I was fishing for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right, and we have a website, and there's a resource list on the website. We have time you know, for one more question. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Do, do you know roughly what 
percentage of the retail prices flip? Yeah, I'm sorry. You, you were you here oh, at the beginning? I'm sorry. No, that's right. Well, let's go back because I still I, th I think that's an interesting thing to end on. Yeah. Because McLean's, which is the magazine, uh, Time Magazine, you know, equivalent in Canada. So they figured it was a fourteen dollars shirt. This is fourteen dollars. So they did. They crunched the numbers, and of that fourteen dollars, twelve cents was labor, and the factory profits was fifty-eight percent. Yeah. And what happens is that the actual cost of production was under six bucks. So that means that the retailers and the brands typically cut, you know, split the 60%. Or if you have Nike store or an American, you know, uh, you have your own store, then you keep all 60%. So that means eight bucks out of the 14 is pure profit. So how many shirts do they make? Because I know that's different currencies and everything. Oh, no, hundreds. They make, I mean, any, any of these factories. I mean, people's production quotas are in the hundreds. Mm -hmm. Individual factory, individual factory workers, their production for a shift is hundreds of garments. So, I mean, the amount of money that's involved here is just astronomical. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason why. I mean, you could double this, yeah. you know, triple it. What impact is it going to have, you know? Yeah. It's just, you know, it's greed. It's, you know, it's, it's capitalism where short-term quarterly results are the most important and the only thing that matters. But this has also changed a lot with, goes in tandem with just the, the, the global changes in the fashion industry, right? Where now you have, what, every three months you have a turnover of fashion? fashion new fashion. colors, new shapes, new whatever that everybody in the developed world you know, shifts to every three to four months because then you can't be seen wearing what you were wearing three months ago because then you're out of style. So you create this kind of, you know, consumerism of these things that somebody has to produce and then you gotta fuss them out and then you get new ones, you know. And then and that's companies like Ross and Marshalls. So Absolutely, uh, yeah. You know, uh, there's a professor on campus by the name of Dar O'Rourke actually is uh, sort of an expert on, on what's called fast, fast fashion where all of these companies are going to, to they have six seasons, eight seasons, 12 seasons a year, just as she was saying. What's the name of the person? Dar O'Rourke. Dar O'Rourke. You can Google him. He's got lots of on his website. And he's, he's a guy that set up the Good Guide. If you ever heard of Good Guide? Uh, but in any case, he teaches on campus, Dar O'Rourke. And he's got lots of articles on fast fashion, cool. which is a huge part of it. Yeah, in my, one of my interdisciplinary studies classes, we're reading about Marx and capitalism, his book, because it was just all about workers' expectation. And so, yeah, it's Same deal, just a couple hundred years later, that's all. That's the thing, though, it's still, <laughs> that's the thing, like, it was existing in America, and uh -huh. then just got shifted over. And if I can, uh, two seconds, I just want to, since I have them here, people want to know why buildings in, in Bangladesh fall down? And I brought a bunch of photographs from, so this, this is a factory building, right? This is a factory building, looks factory building, looks pretty, pretty stable, pretty normal factory building. There's another one. Here's how they're made. There's no structural steel in this building, none whatsoever. So the way they are is you go up on the coast, the posts, you have, you have rebar and posts, and then you lay uh, the, the, uh, the floor, the slab of the next one. So. You know, so his, this is probably going to, this is about six or seven, they're gonna, there's going to be an eight-story building. There's no steel in that. So if you put up here, for example, heavy vibrating electrical generators or the materials for the factories, uh, then you have the possibility once this, this slab cracks, uh, then the whole thing goes. So here's, here's where you start out. You can see here's the rebar. This is going to be floor three. There's no steel there. You just go up with the posts, and then you, then you lay a slab. Here's a slab that's being laid. This is a big convention center. This is what it's going to look like. Imagine this. No, no steel in this thing at all. And then on the side of the road, of course, where you need the bamboo to hold up the, the floors and the next floor up, so you have quite a few of those. Here's another example, right? So here's where you, have, you go up with the, the posts and the slabs. And then what you do is you brick it in. And then you plaster over the brick so it looks like just a, a regular old normal building. This was, uh, they're adding three stories here again uh, to a building that had been originally built. You can see here the, the, the white or the concrete or the, uh, the uh, posts and the slab, and then you fill in with the, 
with the bricks. And that's what makes the outer wall. This is all unreinforced masonry. So once it goes, then down she comes. There's another example. That's, you know, this, this is what, these look just like that when they were being built. And then the brick kilns are really crucial to the industry. The brick kiln, believe it or not, garment industry is actually a good thing to work on in Bangladesh because the alternatives, uh, tanneries, brick kilns, ship breaking, are worse. And this, the brick kilns here, uh, this is an area between downtown Dhaka's over here and Savar, which is where uh, uh, Rana Plaza was here. And so they have this big floodplain. So there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 uh, brick kilns here. And what happens is that during the flood years, when during the flood time of the year, the water is actually up to here. Uh, and so they only have about uh, five months out of the year where they make bricks. And it's a lot of child labor, and people are forced to go into these, these big uh, ovens to pull out bricks, hot bricks, uh, for very low wages. And one of the things about construction in, in um, construction sites is no gravel. So in order to make concrete, you need gravel. So you have somebody whose job it is at a construction site to sit there with a brick and a ball-peen hammer and break the bricks all day to make uh, the broken bricks to be uh, the gravel for the concrete. So you can see here's another. They, they, they laid, uh, you know, with the bamboo holding them up, they laid the slabs and they're building up. Uh, the stairways, of course, aren't supported by any metal either. This is just a rebar going uh, in down this way. Uh, you can see here, here's the rebar for one of the struts. This is not going not to carry much weight. This is a bad idea, too. This is where they put the electrical. These are PVC pipes. So if they start burning, if you have an electrical uh, fire, then the PVC turns into dioxin and other toxic substances. So not, and it also spreads the fire. The pipes themselves will burn. So if you have a fire up here, it'll, it'll come down. So, and this was the top of a six-story building that was looking to go, go skyward. So that's why you have, uh, you have the uh, building collapses. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> we are out of time. But I want to thank Garrett Brown for this very compelling talk and for everyone for attending.